The following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. Uh, it's not just, you know, um, a product. It's not just a job. It's also all of the friends that you made with that. It's also all of the friends that you made with the community. It's all, also all of the experiences that you got. TIQ podcast. Today I'm speaking with Juan Manuel Rodriguez de Fago, blockchain developer at GraphOps. If you're a longtime listener of the GRTIQ podcast, then you know that Juan was a guest back in April 2021 for episode four when he came onto the podcast to share his personal background and journey into Web3 and the graph. Since that time, Juan went to work with GraphOps, a core dev team working on the graph, and there are a lot of reasons why I wanted to speak with Juan again. He's incredibly active and well-respected throughout the ecosystem, but I also wanted to hear the story for how he found his way working on a core dev team and what that experience has been like. But in addition to all of that, Juan is another really interesting story of someone contributing to the graph. Despite having different roles with various teams throughout the years, he's never left the graph ecosystem and he stayed anchored to the protocol, and I wanted to explore some of the reasons why. During this interview, Juan shares some great stories about the early days of the graph, how he went to work at GraphOps, and some important initiatives happening throughout the ecosystem, like Graph Horizon and New Era. I started this interview by welcoming Juan back to the podcast and asking him to briefly introduce himself. Sure thing. Uh, well, so first of all, I'm Juan Manuel Rodriguez de Fago. Pretty long name, I know, but it is what it is. I was born this way. So for people that haven't listened uh, to the other uh, episode well first of all go listen to the other episode it was it was pretty fun uh, recording it with nick but yeah i mean i've been involved with the graph for well way too long of a time now uh since early 2020 it was even before the pandemic so you know it, it's a pretty distant dream nowadays so yeah i've, I've been involved in the graph uh, in multiple ways i've been mainly a subgraph developer uh, for a long long time uh been working, you know, trying to support different, you know, uh, protocols like uh, Kyber, Kyber DAO, Compound, Over B2, you know, many, many different protocols uh, along the, those, those years. Uh, and also I've been involved, you know, working with the subgraph for the network. Uh, I'm basically the main, you know, maintenance guy of the, of the uh, network subgraph. Uh, but I've been doing it through many, many different companies. Like I've, I've been working initially in Protofire, then in Bootnode, and I'm working with GraphOps now. Uh, I've been working GraphOps since uh, early 2022, I think. So almost two years, if I'm not mistaken. It's weird, like time passes by so, so weirdly in, in Web3. So it feels like I'm, you know, 80 years old and I'm barely getting into the 30s. So yeah, well, that's that's pretty much it. What's the backstory for why you went to work at GraphOps? I mean, you... I interviewed you initially because you're an OG, as you said there. You've been around for a long time. And as I was getting GRTIQ podcast started, you were in the forum, you were in the Discord, you were everywhere. And so I'm like, I got to speak with this guy. But as you advanced and sort of hung around the ecosystem, you eventually went to work at GraphOps. And for listeners that don't know, GraphOps is one of the core dev teams that are helping to contribute to the graph, launched by Chris Wessels, another guest of the podcast. But what's the backstory for why you went and joined GraphOps? Yeah, so I guess the backstory would be like, you know, I like in early 2020, I started my crypto journey, so to speak. I was already a software developer back then, uh, but I had no experience in Web3. Uh, and in early 2020, I kind of like jumped ship and started working at Protofire. After, you know, a year or so, I moved to Woodnode, which was kind of like a smaller company uh, with, with a lot of people from uh, previously that I, that I previously worked on on Protofire. And basically we were, you know, kind of like a dev shop, so to speak, for, you know, early crypto projects, trying to, you know, kickstart those, those projects in the early stages. 
uh, but we had already a lot of, you know, work done with the graph. So we kind of like continued working with the graph. I, again, I had been working with the graph since early 2020 uh, with those same uh, people. So we kind of like continued uh, the journey. And at some point kind of like would not uh, wanted to kind of like change their, their, you know, not ways of doing things because, you know, it was a company that was mostly focused on early verticals and the graph was already established. So they kind of like decided, okay, let's, you know, part ways, uh, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, from my perspective, I wanted to keep going with the graph. I, I kind of like really enjoyed what I was doing. So I kind of like decided, okay, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't agree with, with that decision or at least it's not that I don't agree. You know, I understand why that decision was being made, but I want to continue my journey with the graph. So I kind of like tried to, you know, find new ways of, of collaborating. At Budno, we kind of like figured out, okay, if we want to continue with the graph, we, we would want to be core developers as many of the other ones. I, I think at that point it was, I think it was Figment, the gen node, uh, and streaming fast or some along those lines. But yeah, the, uh, when they kind of like decided that they wanted to, you know, part ways, um, with, with all of the work that was being in the graph and kind of like relocate those resources to, you know, all their early projects, I kind of say, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to find a different uh, way of doing things. And, uh, well, it was kind of like a month or so that I kind of like was, uh, thinking of, of potential ways of collaborating either as a, you know, an external contributor or, you know, joining edge and node was one of the options. And then kind of like, uh, I was discussing with, uh, Chris, Chris Wessels, uh, and Jim, uh, you know, Jim from the council, uh, well, uh, not anymore from the council, but you know, Jim, uh, from everywhere. So yeah, we, we basically had a, a little chat and, uh, I always value, uh, I mean, I, I had a relationship with, with both Jim and, and Chris from the early days of the network. Uh, we were all, participants in mission control. Uh, so we had a great relationship and I kind of like wanted to, to have their opinions, uh, you know, you know figure it out. What do you think that I should do? Because, you know, it's a weird situation to be in. You want to collaborate and you don't exactly know in which way you want to collaborate. Uh, but at the same time, you have been collaborating for so long that it kind of like it just continuing the work stream makes sense. So I guess like the discussion that we had with Jim, uh, initially with Jim and then with Chris was I can either like they, they, were really into the idea of me continuing working with the graph. Uh, they kind of like figured out that joining Edge and Node would be, you know, the easiest solution. Everything is kind of like ready uh, in place. It, you're just, you know, another employee that will be continuing the work. You don't really need to do anything, uh, you know, uh, scaffolding wise or, you know, bureaucratically wise. Uh, you don't need to set up, you know, accounts. You don't need to set up anything. It's, it's the easiest solution. Uh, but at the same time, it's not... It, it, and, you know, you, you will be in a really huge core development team, which, which has, you know, their own agenda, so to speak. So you won't have as much freedom as if you do it yourself, uh, which again, it's, 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 it's not a bad thing. You know, it's just, uh, the way that it is, it's, you know, you're joining a big company instead of, you know, creating something new. So what Jim basically said was, uh, I think you will be doing a lot more of what you want to do if you just, you know, either start your own company or work as a a solo contractor, or, uh, there's another, like a third option, which was that, you know, we could join teams with, with Chris, uh, and at the time, uh, basically GraphOps was just Chris. So it wasn't like, it wasn't, I mean, we are still a small team, but it's not just Chris now. So it was, it was kind of like a weird situation where Chris wasn't expecting to have to, you know, scaffold all of the bureaucratic parts of, of, of GraphOps, you know, setting up the bank accounts setting up the, you know, the legal entities and all of those things that as a developer, you usually don't, you don't experience, but he, he kind of like saw the opportunity and he wanted me to join the team. So he basically started working like crazy towards, you know, uh, setting up graph ops, uh, as a company and figuring out the place in the, in the graph ecosystem that graph ops was going to take part in. Uh, and we basically, you know, after that, that chat with Chris and with Jim, I basically said, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to, you know, join GraphOps. Uh, and, and that's basically where it, where it went. Like I, I was basically working for a month or two months as a kind of like solo contractor while Chris was setting everything up. Uh, and after that, you know, I joined, uh, the team, the newly created team with, uh, both Chris and Anna, uh, you probably, well, I think you already uh, did a, a session with Anna where we were basically the, the three first people from GraphOps. So it was a pretty nice thing. It was also quite challenging, you know, like small teams are, uh, you have so much that you want to work on and at the same time, very little time because you don't have a lot of people to work on those things. 
but it was it was super fun and and watching the team grow over time was also super super fun and and you know inspiring to be honest for listeners that are joining this podcast maybe for the first time i've interviewed a host of the people that juan just referenced there i've spoken with chris wessels before jim cousins was a one time graph council member but leads wave 5 which is a OG indexer at the graph. And of course, you mentioned Anna there who is on graph ops. I also had the opportunity to interview here. So I'll put links in the show notes for anybody that wants to go back and listen to some of those episodes and get a little more context here. So Juan, that's really interesting to me. And this is one of the things that I've always sort of loved about the graph ecosystem is the fluidity at which people can kind of move around. But in addition to that, the opportunities that exist. And so here you are, you know, you're working at Bootnode. They decide to change kind of what they're going to do. And instead of you needing to find a new gig or getting super desperate, you just start networking with other contributors. And uh, lo and behold, you kind of meet up with Chris and you guys decide to take GraphOps from just a sole proprietor indexer to a core dev team. For listeners that find that hard to believe that the graph really is that fluid and there is such a network, I mean, how would you describe how that works? Like, why is it that there is a place for everybody in the graph? Hmm. It's a really interesting question. Um, well, I guess I, my my answer, of course, will be really biased because I've been in the graphical system not since the like you know since the beginning beginning because it was like I think it it, it be, everything began in 2018 so everything was you know pretty new back then but I was basically since the beginning of the network or even before the beginning of the network to be honest we kind of like worked towards the 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 launch of the network during mission control so. I guess like in a way is, you know, it, it's a, first of all, it's a, a pretty interesting proposition. Like, you know, it's a pretty interesting product in and of itself. It's, you know, decentralized querying, indexing, you know, it, it's data infrastructure. It, it, it has a lot of challenges regarding, you know, economics, uh, because you have to figure out, okay, how do we incentivize those things? There are a lot of interesting challenges. And then you have all of the, you know, subgraph side of things, because again, that's what I was mostly working on, but I also, kind of like wet my feet with, uh, you know, economics stuff. But from one perspective, you have all of the, all of the interesting challenges. And then from the other perspective, you also have all of the interesting, interesting people that you met along those years of working at the graph. So I I guess like, you know, for people that just join, it's usually pretty challenging to, you know, do networking. But at the same time, like when I started working at the graph, I was, uh, software developer that only had like three, four years of experience, which again, it's, it's not, it's actually quite a lot, but, uh, I, I was, you know, already, uh, not, I, I don't want to say established developer, but I, I knew what I was doing, but at the same time, it was just a new ecosystem. So I was, you know, trying to figure out, okay, who's, who's who here, who should I be discussing these things with? Uh, and even from the, you know, early days of mission control, for example, I was tasked with uh, you know, working on the indexer. I'm, again, I'm not a DevOps. I'm not an SRE. I'm, I don't have a lot of infrastructure experience. Uh, all of the infrastructure experience that I have comes from, you know, uh, projects that I did at university. So again, those things are, you know, you learn a lot of things in university, but it's not, you know, production ready, so to speak. Uh, so there were a lot of challenges from the real world that I had to to figure out when I was doing mission control. And uh, I had, again, I had no idea who to speak uh, to. And I just went into this court, you know, asked a few questions and suddenly I'm chatting with Payne, you know, with, with Alex. Uh, and, and we were having like such, such fun trying to make everything work. And at the same time, he told me, Hey, we have a, you know, an indexer from an indexer group from, from mission control that we are discussing all of those things, uh, in, so you want to join? And I was like, sure. I mean, he, he, like, I, I still remember the, the first time we had this conversation. He told me, we discussed the infrastructure things, but we're also kind of like clowns. You're okay with that? <laughs> and it was like, from the very beginning, you, you could see how it was, it was going to go. And it was super fun. Like it was, it was basically a, a bunch of, of friends trying to, you know, make those things work. Uh, Mission Control was, again, a, a really interesting time period for the graph because there was so much going on. We had constant updates to the infrastructure. Uh, you know, stack, uh, you had uh, a lot of chats with Janice, you had a lot of chats with, you know, even Brandon from the, uh, economic side of things, uh, Brandon Ramirez. 
uh, which again, I think all of those have been also in the podcast. So it, it, I think the notes for this podcast will have so many links. It's going to be amazing. But yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, such a fun time. And again, I was a newcomer. I I didn't know anyone. It's not like I joined with a bunch of friends. I joined basically solo. And, you know, in a couple of weeks I had, uh, I, I was having discussions with people that you now know as, you know, Jim, uh, the guy that, that runs y- Wave 5 and, and was at the council. You now know Payne as the one that, you know, uh, has this uh, cool, you know, stack for, for indexers. You now know Chris as the uh, founder of, of GraphOps. But there's still, you know, people, you, you, can, you can approach them, you can have discussions with them. And I think that's, that's one of the things that, that I value most of the ecosystem, that you can basically chat with anyone that you want. You can uh, approach anyone. And as long as you want to, you know, work on stuff, as long as you want to have fun with that, no one's going to say no. You know, like people are actually looking for people that are interested in, you know, taking part in the ecosystem. So I think that's, that's what I value the most and what, I, what I'm most amazed at for, for, for the ecosystem itself. Based on what you've shared, I mean, there was clearly one point in your history where you could have very easily exited the graph ecosystem and gone to work somewhere else. And my suspicion is there's probably been a couple points along this multi-year journey where maybe you could go join another ecosystem or maybe you just pursue something entirely different. So the question is, why do you stay kind of tethered to the graph ecosystem? Why is this the place you've decided to keep persisting in and finding ways to contribute? Well, I mean, yes, like there, there's the clear point in time, like when I was, was deciding whether I, I stay at Budno or not. Again, the people at Budno have been great. Like they, they've been super amazing. They have been just as, as friendly as the people in the graph. And I, w- I could have, you know, decided to start working on, on other, the other projects that they had, like for, for, you know, other maybe L2 projects or, you know, whatever, Polka, whatever, wherever it might be. Uh, and they were all extremely interesting too. Like it's, it's not, you know, uh, I'm not trying to oversell the graph and undersell everyone else. All of the other persons were super interesting too. Uh, but I guess like, you know, when you feel like you belong somewhere, it's really hard to get out of that place, uh, in a sense. And you don't really want to, yeah, because you know, it's been, it's not only been that the project, it's interesting, but you kind of like make friends along the way. You kind of like start you know, getting involved in, in, you know, a lot of the, you know, low level discussions of, of what's going to happen with the future of this. Uh, and then you start, you know, uh, really getting embedded into all of those things. And you start to, you know, y- you get more and more enjoyment as time goes on. It's kind of like, you know, wine that uh, as it gets old, it gets better. Like it's kind of like that way, uh, at least for me. Uh, and it's not just that the project gets better, uh, because you get, you know, more embedded into it, but all of the relationships that come with it also get more mature, uh, and it gets more, more and more interesting. And then, then you have other, you know, you have other, other things you can do because I get, again, I started as a subgraph developer initially. So it was just, you know, like I was making subgraphs, uh, initially just for, uh, different projects to kickstart the usage of the graph on those projects. Uh, for example, like when, when I started, it was early 2020, not many projects. I mean, th- there were a lot of projects that had top graphs back in the day, like Uniswap was already a thing, but you had a lot of other, uh, you know, projects that were still trying to figure out, okay, what's my indexing solution. And they maybe didn't know about the graph, or maybe they thought that, you know, setting up a sub graph would be, you know, a huge challenge or whatever. So the way that, that initially we were tasked on, on kind of like trying to improve the, the experience of the users was, okay, we can kickstart the, the initial version and then you know, of the subgraph and then kind of like telling you, okay, this is how it works. This is what you probably need to do if you need to upgrade it or whatever. And, and kind of like kickstart that process for them. And initially, you know, it was kind of like a very repetitive process. I was reading a lot of contracts, trying to figure out okay, what's the best way to uh, code this subgraph. Uh, what's the best way to make it upgradable? What's the best way, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then suddenly I started, you know, progressing. And then I was tasked with, okay, we have a new thing which is coming, which is a network. And it's going to be a huge challenge to maintain the subgraph, uh, which again, Dave has already kickstarted. Uh, it was, it was such a huge uh, joy working with Dave and trying to. That was Dave Capost, right? Yeah. I, I always kind of like mix up the, the surname, but yeah, I think it was, uh, he was the initial developer of the subgraph. He was part of Edge and Node. Well, it wasn't even called Edge and Node back in the day. It was just graph, you know, it was, 
uh, a whole thing. So yeah, I mean, it was, it was super nice progressing into that and then progressing into running a, an indexer at the same time that you're maintaining those things. And then, you know, progressing into more and more things and kind of like evolving over time into, into more, you know, I don't want to say fulfilling uh, projects because it was fulfilling all the way, but it's, uh, you know, different every time, but at the same time it's familiar. So it's, it's, it's weird, but it's nice. You know, it's, it's, it's really enjoyable. If you go back in your mind to those early days and we're talking early, early days to present, what's changed the most? Like, has it changed? Has the protocol evolved? Has the community evolved? What's some of your points of observation about that growth? Uh, well, I mean, there's like a few ways that you can take a look at this. Like one of the ways would be, remember the early days of the network where no one knew how it worked. So it was all experimenting, you know, like no one knew what the indexer cuts were doing, like how to efficiently optimize those cuts, how to, you know, figure out, like, I mean, even in the early days, we only had one subgraph in the network just because, you know, it was just at launch and everything was super easy. And then we had more subgraphs that we needed to figure out how to optimize, how to generate formulas to optimize those, those rewards. And then you had to kind of like understand that some concepts that we have kind of like grown accustomed to like the effective cut they didn't exist back then we kind of like made them up as we go uh okay we we know that the indexer cut works this way but how do we calculate the return on the logators and then we kind of like started figuring all those things up so i think and also people didn't understand those concepts at first because it was so you know weird because why would i want to calculate a new thing and then they started realizing so uh one of the things that i see like the community around the network particularly evolved is that there was a lot of, you know, ways that we tried to figure out how to educate people in those, you know, in, in, in the inner workings of the, of the economics, particularly of the network. And how do we, you know, make sure that all of the indexes know that what they're doing economically wise so that they have a profitable uh, business and they kind of like understand how, how everything works. Uh, and at the same time, you know, how to educate the subgroup developers into how the network works and how uh, it's going to you know, it's going to solve some of the issues uh, regarding, you know, uh, maybe not latency because latency is, is similar, you know, like the idea is that we are a little bit better than the host service, but it's not going to be, you know, like a 10x better in latency. It, it depends again, on the geo distribution that you have, but whatever. Uh, but at least on the side of, you know, availability, you have decentralization, you have a lot, a lot more robust of a network than just, you know, a single centralized product. So, you know, educating developers on that, educating on how to publish the, the subgraphs onto the network, because again, it's, it's all new. It's, you know, it's a different process. Uh, it's not the same process that it was in hosted service because there's a lot of extra things that you need to take care of, like actually, you know, sending the transaction so that the data is available on the uh, contracts. And then also, you know, making sure that, you know, how to upgrade, you know, the requirements for upgrades, you know, you know, everything. And, and it's even going up until now, we have, Every day we have more and more tools that are useful, but at the same time, you also need to understand how those tools work and what they offer uh, you. Uh, one example would be something that we've been working on at uh, GraphOps, uh, which is GraphCast and all of the, you know, different radios and, and such and how those things can help, you know, uh, developers signal that they are about to release a new upgrade so that indexers can start presyncing it or how uh, indexers can, you know, cross-check POIs uh, to make sure that the data is okay and, and so on and so forth. Even uh, stuff that also other stuff that we've been working on at GraphOps, like, like Launchpad, to kind of help indexers have a Kubernetes setup that, that's scalable and relatively easy to use, hopefully, uh, if we did things right, you know, and, and also have client diversity in the ecosystem. You know, one of the things that, that initially happened is like Payne had this super easy to set up Docker Compose stakes with setup but we also don't want to have like a single, you know, client. So it's not a client, but, you know, you can run everything bare metal and, and do it yourself. But people oftentimes, you know, like scaffolding tools. Uh, so trying to get more client diversity, trying to, you know, make things easy for different types of users that want to scale with a cluster, that want to scale with single resources, whatever. So, you know, the, the, this kind of like evolution over time of uh, the education aspects of the graph as well as the new features that we keep on adding because uh, the early version of the contracts had like way, way different ways of doing things that, that we are 
currently having. Like, I remember when uh, all of the drama for, uh, I think it was GIP2, like one of the early GIPs, which, which allowed indexers to, you know, get rewards out without having to wait 28 days so they can actually pay for the infrastructure. Uh, and a lot of the drama that, that like, you know, happened at that time. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a necessary evil to, you know, have those discussions and have that drama. Even if we don't usually like drama, it was needed so that, you know, people were getting involved and understanding those, those, you know, really valid points from one side and the, and the other, uh, and have those discussions and have those, yeah, you know, like if the people don't get involved, they usually don't, you know, they, they kind of like run an autopilot and ideally you, you want them to actually get involved. And, and even if it, it hurts a little bit, like, you know, the drama always hurts. Uh, I think it's kind of like something that, that needed to happen for people to actually understand, uh, why everything needed to go that way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there are many ways that this has evolved over time, like technically wise with all of the new improvements. Ecosystem wise, with all of you, you know, like all of the new participants that we are having, all of the new indexers, uh, even, you know, we had even programs to onboard new indexers into new chains like MIPS, for example, to make sure that we have all of the coverage that we're having in, in the hosted service with all of the new features that were being added also translate to the network and also have some sort of like, you know, short period of time where, where indexers were getting, you know, a little bit of like test time to figure out okay, this, this network works the best way with this kind of like setup or this kind of like setup and, you know, make sure that everything works correctly before we, we put it to the network. And all of those things, you know, were, I would say quite not refreshing because it's not, you know, it's not something like weird and new and innovative, but at least it was super interesting to see it, you know, develop over time. And that even if it had its challenges, like I remember MIPS had a lot of challenges uh, mainly even with, with uh, I think Optimism had some issues. We we were doing the MIPS round and they had to do some kind of like regenesis or I don't even remember what happened. But but even if it had all of those challenges, those challenges were interesting and they were super useful to understand, okay, this is the real world. These things can happen. How do we approach those, you know, critical moments where you need to take decisions? We need to, you know, figure out how to best approach this, how to make, you know, all of the participants in the ecosystem be able to respond to those uh, rapid changes in, in, in the, you know, environment and how do, how do we, how do we make sure that everything works as best as it can work, uh, over time. And I think in a way, the ecosystem itself has succeeded over time and has been repeatedly tested. And even if it still has challenges, you know, uh, we can discuss, uh, graph B1 versus graph four eyes. And we have discussed got like, there, there's a lot of discussions that are happening inside of the core development team so, uh, that are also, you know, slowly being released, like Graph Horizon, for example. I think there, there was a forum post. But yeah, I mean, those, those discussions are super interesting. There are super valid points from each side. But even if, it, you know, people don't agree with one thing and they don't agree with the other, I think the, the, the extremely nice part of the ecosystem, you know, is that even if you don't agree with something, you can have your voice heard. And I think the forum really kind of like makes this extremely explicit, uh, particularly uh, with, I think there was a few discussions lately, like the indexing fees one, where indexers were really against the, you know, change from indexing rewards to indexing fees. And I think it really allowed the economics team of the core developer teams to, you know, get a sense of, okay, we are in the, you know, theoretical land and then we have to figure out like a real solution to something and then we have like real actors of those things that are telling us i don't think this is going to work this is maybe maybe you need to take a look at this side or this side or this new possible way or maybe what if we do this what if we do that and all of those you know all of that feedback uh again is always extremely welcome and, and actually helps uh shape the future a lot a lot better into something that's actually useful and not something that's you know theoretically useful the GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graph Foundation. The Graph Grants program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, gaps, subgraphs, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graph.Foundation. That's the Graph.Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ, and thank you for listening. 
Listeners who enjoy this content can help support the GRTIQ podcast by leaving a review or a five-star rating wherever they download podcasts, by sharing episodes on social media, or by simply telling a friend or colleague about something they heard or learned from one of our guests. It's support from listeners like you that make it possible for us to keep shining a light on the people and stories behind Web3 and the graph. You mentioned a couple things there, and again, I'll put links in the show notes for any listener that wants to catch up on some context, but you mentioned Graph Horizon, and indeed, there was a recent forum post and blog post published on the topic. Additionally, you mentioned the radios that uh, Graph Ops has been working on, and there was a recent blog post published on Subgraph Radio that talks a little bit about how that works and the benefits to indexers and Subgraph developers. And of course, as part of the new era roadmap, Sunrise of Decentralized Data, Graph Horizon, all these different things kind of sit within there. And there's an in-depth blog post on New Era. I want to ask you one question about New Era of the Graph, and it's that sunrise of decentralized data for listeners that want to be brought up to speed. That's essentially the deprecation of the hosted service and moving all traffic to the network. And this is happening via an upgrade indexer. So this will be something that moves over and ensures that all that traffic is served as indexers add it and provide additional support. What are your thoughts about Sunrise of Decentralized Data, Upgrade Indexer, and all that's happening there? I mean, there's like a couple ways that you can view it. Like the overall sensation is like, it's super cool to finally see, you know, I I don't want to say like forcibly moving people over because it's technically, it's technically going to be kind of like the same thing. Uh, But it's finally that moment that it's been, it's been, kind of like discussed for so long, like even publicly, it's been discussed that hosted service is just like an interim solution to a more, you know, interesting uh, challenge. And I think what what's most interesting is that the core developer team from Edge and Node kind of like found a way where they could reuse everything that's been learned uh, with the hosted service. Like again, people have to realize the hosted service, we, we talk about hosted service as something that's, that's you know, always there like hosted service is a giant beast of an infrastructure uh, that's been uh, run by edge and node and the foundation basically for free for so long that people have to realize like it's basically like having like i don't know like 50 60 100 index i don't even know the size of it but from the the things that i could see it's it's like a huge infrastructure that has been serving I don't even know, like 10,000 subgraphs for like forever. Like I've been deploying subgraphs all the time. So I've been, I've been having discussions with David, uh, David Dutter, uh, and many other of the uh, other participants of the, you know, um, infrastructure team from Agent Node regarding many things about hosted service over the years. But we have to think that that all of the traffic that that huge infrastructure is going to serve, or it was serving actually, is going to be slowly moving to the network. And I mean, slowly moving, even if we turn it off one day and just uh, use the upgrade indexer. I, I don't know all of the details because, I, again, this is an edge and node project. It's not a graph ops. Like, I barely know a few things about it. But from what I could understand, like, you can think of the upgrade indexer as kind of like taking the infrastructure from the hosted service and kind of like putting it into the network. Like, kind of like just, uh, I don't know, like uh, linking it to, a, to an indexer in the network and reusing all of the infrastructure so that all of the things that were possible in hosted service are possible now in the network and are kind of like being subsidized, I think, for a while. Uh, I don't know if the free query plan is already live, but it was something that was discussed during, uh, I think, Sunray phase. Uh, again, there are some, there's many things going on in the ecosystem, so I might be, you know, a little bit outdated on some things, but from what I could think of, like it's, it's basically taking the hosted service and putting it into a network. Uh, reusing all of the existing databases, making sure that all of, all of the things that were already indexed continue to be indexed in the network if you so desire. Like if you publish the subgraph, it should be available as soon as, as you publish it if it was live in hosted service, uh, which, you know, makes a lot of the challenges that we were having with, you know, N minus one issues with, with subgraph upgrades, which is when, when you upgrade a new, uh, upgrade your subgraph and you kind of like get your old subgraph delisted. So like it's not listed, but indexers you know, move from the old subgraph to the new one so they don't serve. That, that's the N minus one problem. And that those things are not as problematic when you have all of the hosted service infrastructure backing, backing it up in the network itself. You kind of get kind of like a, a giant safety net 
in the network, uh, which is super cool to know to to have. I think we had something similar with the uh, there was kind of like um plan that was mentioned at some point that was kind of like this safety net of uh, you know indexers that would run this. Uh, how was it called? I, I don't even remember. I think P2P also participated in these, like Edge and Node also kind of like set up a few of those indexers. But it was basically indexers that were not going to be competing with other indexers for indexing rewards. They were just going to be doing it, you know, altruistically, just to kind of like create a safety net. But in this way, you get an, an even bigger safety net, which is everything that existed in hosted service kind of like moving to the network uh, in a way. Uh, and it's super cool to see all of those proposals come to life. Because I, you know, having been in the graph for so long, you kind of like remember times when I, I remember when we discussed, for example, uh, the L2 migration, and it was something that was so far away. Like you can, you, you, we had all of these discussions in the retreats where we were, you know, sketching out in, in pen and paper. Okay, this should be this way, and this should be this way, and then you're actually coding those things, and then you're you're figuring out, okay, this doesn't work. Like you, you we have these technical limitations with the bridges. We need to figure out those things. Uh, and then we have some amazing people, you know, taking care of those, of those, uh, discussions of the, of, of brainstorming that's, that's required for that. And then you kind of like see it live. And, and, and for me, it was super weird to see that we are now basically all kind of like participating in L2 already. Like it's something that's, that's natural now. And it's so weird for me because I, I still think in, ter- in terms of mainnet and it's, you know, it's, it's Arbitrum 1 now. Uh, and then you see Sunray and then you see the upgrade index and then you kind of like start discussing the upgrade index and okay, this is going to work this way. And this is, you know, and everything's kind of like cloudy and then still uh, shrouded in mystery. And then suddenly you have it working and, and it's, you know, it's there, people can use it and, and, um, it works. And, and then you're amazed again because of, you know, how much of a big brain most of the participants in the ecosystem are. So again, yeah, I, for, for the most part. It's going to be super, again, getting back into the question, I always kind of branch out way too much. Getting back into the question, uh, I think Sunrise is going to be, it's going to be amazing. Like the, the, I think it's three stages. I think it's Sunrise, Sunbeam and Sunrise. Uh, but it's going to be amazing to see all of those three stages, you know, progress, evolve, and eventually come into something that, you know, we've been discussing for so long and, and we can naturalize that it happened and that it works, you know? So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for all of the, new things that are going to be coming to the network. Well, I share the same perspective. I remember interviewing AJ Warner from Arbitrum and then some of the team at Edge and Node about the move to L2. And at the time it was novel and uh, now we're there and everybody's transacting on L2 and the move has been a huge success. And so time goes by fast. And again, longtime listeners will probably have the same observation. I want to go back to another initiative that you referenced there. And again, this is all very new. Uh, listeners of the podcast know that I interviewed Zach Burns from Edge and Node at the end of last year to talk about this new proposal called Graph Horizon, which in essence is a V2 of the graph. You're a busy person, Juan. You're working on a million different things. Have you had the opportunity to kind of look at Graph Horizon? And do you have any early opinions on what it proposes to do for the protocol? Uh, well, I mean, participating in the retreats, you get exposed to all of those things. So I kind of like know a little bit about Horizon. I was even sort of like involved in the early discussions, uh, which again, have nothing to do with how Horizon is shaped now. Like there has been an immense amount of work uh, by Zach and all of the, you know, Edge and Node team mostly. It, it has gone through so many stages of, you know, thinking and rethinking the, you know, take all of the learnings that we had from actually running a protocol for like three years now. Like it's, it's crazy to even say three years, but three years now. And try to, you know, figure out, okay, if this didn't work, how can we take something new and make it into what we hoped B1 was going to be and make it, you know, more useful for the indexers and for the users and, you know, really thinking about the end-to-end experience. And again, I don't, th- I don't, I don't think I remember all of the details and I wouldn't want to think that I can actually know all of the details for Horizon because I remember when, when Zach presented it in the last retreat. It was uh, like, uh, I think it was one of the most packed meetings that we had during the retreat. Like it was like every seat was filled. Everyone was, you know, uh, even if, if you didn't have a seat, you were standing up uh, watching Zach talk about Horizon. It was super interesting. There were a few of, the, of those uh, discussions during the retreat that you could see that people were extremely, uh, you know, hyped about. Horizon was one of them. And kind of like figuring out the best way to make 
new data um, services be able to be integrated as, as simply as possible. Uh, because again, one of the other things, we have world of data services. Uh, we're trying to figure out the graph as a something, uh, as, a, as a kind of a more complex protocol than just serving subgraphs uh, and serving substreams and SQL and, and files and, and all of the other data services that we can have. And then we have the, the issue that B1 is kind of like limiting in a way for some of those things because it wasn't really thought uh, in a way that would allow those things to extremely easily be added. It's not that you can't, it's just that you have a lot more challenges than if you thought of a way uh, initially that, that could take care of those, those use cases. Horizon kind of like also integrates those things into the, into the environment, into the, the contracts. Uh, and then you have all of these kind of like more modular design, uh, so to speak. But yeah, you have all of these kind of like core consensus things happening in the in Horizon. Then you have all of the extendability outside of it where it's kind of like modular and you can play around with it. It's been a huge discussion. And then at the same time, we had a lot of other things to take care of. But thankfully, again, we have a great team behind it. There's been a lot of amazing discussions, a lot of amazing, you know, feedback from the community. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really pumped for it. And the recent forum post invites feedback from the community, much like you talked about earlier, as it relates to GIP2. There is an appetite for everybody to contribute and get involved on this Horizon proposal. So be sure to visit the show notes and go comment and share your thoughts on the Graph Forum. As you talk about your journey in the ecosystem, and we go back to 2020, and as you said there, you talked about your experience on mission control and some of the early tools and infrastructure. And then as you plot forward to where we are today, you've experienced, you know, the MIPS program, which was this bootstrapping of new chains in addition to Ethereum onto the network. You talked about the move to L2. We're kind of talking about the future and Graph Horizon. So a lot of change, a lot of things evolving. How has your conviction for the importance of the graph in Web3 evolved during the same timeline? Well, I, I think we kind of had this discussion. Uh, regarding, you know, why uh, particularly decentralization was important in the last episode or maybe in some other episode. Like I think I've been in a couple of episodes already. So with uh, Payne and Nena, I think. But yeah, I mean, we had some of those discussions. And I think, again, as someone that lives in Argentina and you have all of those, you know, economic challenges and then you kind of like see how, you know, everything changes from government to government and you see how you know, maybe in this government, this happens like this, maybe in the other one, you don't have this kind of like sense of everything's going to always work correctly. And everything, every, every assumption that we have that about how the economy works is always going to gonna be like, like everyone's an honest uh, participant in the, in the environment. You kind of like feel like you always need to have a tool that allows you to, you know, be abstracted from those things, right? Like you need something like, in this case, decentralization that, that kind of like guarantees you that nothing can uh, happen in a way that you don't expect it to. Like if, uh, for example, someone tried to censor you, censorship itself is not something that could happen if something is decentralized. So you don't have those, you don't have to be, I don't want to say afraid, right? But in, in some instances, it, it is afraid, uh, the word that should be used because you have a safety net, right? You have something that ensures that no single participant can actually make your life uh, a living hell, right? And, and again, I, I might be, you know, kind of like overstating, it doesn't have to be a living hell. It's not going to be the apocalypse, but you know, all of those things, like little things, like small censorship here and there can actually make an impact and you can eventually naturalize those things and, you know, get comfortable with those. And that doesn't mean that that should happen. You know, like we should have a system that allows you to not have to worry about those things because you know that the system itself will allow you to still, you know, uh, exist in, in, in any sort of, sort of shape that you want to without having your, you know, your, your, your freedom taken from you. Again, probably really, really big words, but I think that's like from the ideal side of things, like the ideas and, and the beliefs. I think that's what's most important for, for why uh, decentralization is so important. And also why it's so important that uh, the graph has, even if it's taking baby steps at first, because again, we went through hosted service in order to, it was kind of like a stepping stone in order to be able to test the product and make sure that the product was actually good. 
and then figure out, okay, how do we decentralize that product? And then we have Graph V1, so the network, and then we figure out, okay, those things work, but we need to, you know, take some steps to, you know, make sure that everything's going to work in a, in a better way, that everyone's going to be, uh, you know, able to run a successful business out of it. Like it's not going to be something that we need to, you know, uh, sustain ourselves. That is something that's self-sustaining. And, you know, it, it's again, testing and testing and testing new ideas, new ways of, of doing things uh, with the end goal of being, you know, actually having a decentralized network of indexers that can actually serve all of those queries, make sure that those queries are valid, have uh, tools for people to actually verify that those queries are valid, have ways of, you know, taking measures if those, if there's some malicious participant in the network. And I think it, it, it really, it, it's oftentimes understated or, or you know, the, the importance of those things because you oftentimes don't need it. But I think, and, and I'm probably quoting someone somewhere, you don't think you need decentralization until you actually need it, or you 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 can you you basically can live without decentralization until you can't, and when you can't, it's too late. You know, it's you're not gonna get decentralization from one day to the other. You need to have that as a kind of like core belief and a core piece of you know infrastructure if you want it to be available whenever you are gonna be needing it. And and I guess in a world that has been maybe if we said this like ten or twenty years ago like prior to the 2008 crisis, prior to, you know, all of the uh, new wars that are happening here and there, like, you know, with the Russian and Ukraine uh, conflict, the Palestine and Israel conflict. Uh, Now I think people are kind of like understanding why those things are important in a way, or at least having like something that hit closer to home, maybe. But if you said it maybe 20 years ago, people were thriving, whatever, they wouldn't give, you know, they, they wouldn't care about, all of those things. Now it's becoming more and more obvious that those things need to be there uh, in order for us to, you know, continue to have our own freedoms and and be able to uh, exist as as people as we oftentimes do. Because like things can happen really, really quickly in the real world, and you need to be, you know, you need to be prepared for those things. It's kind of like when you, you know, you kind of like neglect your health, right? Like you, you, you say, oh, I'm I'm thirty, I I don't have any health issues, so I don't need to get a checkup. And then you don't get a checkup for three years. And then suddenly, oh, I'm, I don't feel so good. What's, go, what's going on? And then, and, and, you know, go to the doctor and then it's probably, oh, you should have gone like last year. Uh, and maybe you're fine. You know, like maybe you can uh, get better, whatever. Maybe you can't. And it's kind of like the same thing, you know, like it's kind of like you don't have, you, you don't care about decentralization. I want to pay less. I don't, I don't care. I don't care about all of, all of those you know, extra things. Like, I don't care. You just take it away and then you need it. And then you're, oh, whoops. Uh, I should have cared like three years ago. Uh, and I think that's, that's still something that I, I deeply within, believe in. Again, it's probably easier for me, like living in a country that kind of like exemplifies in, in the first person that you really need it, you know, like that, that it's something that's super useful for you. Uh, and I think that that's probably a reason why there's so many Argentinian developers <laughs> in Web3. But, you know, uh, even, even if you don't live in Argentina, uh, I think it's still, it's still pretty useful to have decentralization. And I think it's, it's something that people need to uh, get more in touch. And then uh, if they don't know what it is, they should probably at least watch a YouTube video uh, or a podcast explaining it because it's, it's going to be super important in the future, I guess. I want to ask you about that community in Argentina and maybe even broader Latin America. As I look at the graph ecosystem, there's these pockets of very strong and active communities. There's one in Nigeria, for example, that's fun to watch within the Graph Advocates program. Clearly in San Francisco and associated with that House of Web3, we're seeing some cool things happening there. And you can't have the discussion without mentioning Argentina and their very cool and active graph community from there. Any listener that wants to learn more about, of course, you can go listen to my interview with Lorena Fabris, who is a longtime contributor down there. But you've been featured in a lot of those pictures, the birthday events, the different educational events. For listeners that have kind of missed the growth or the commitment of this community there, how would you describe it? Well, uh, it's it's weird because I've been, I I basically participated in all of the birthday events for the graph uh, every year. Uh, and, And you mentioned Lorena. She's been basically following me around to go, oh, we need to, we need to go do, uh, you know, a workshop here, a workshop there. 
uh, we need to take care of the graph birthday and and, and it's it's amazing to see so much energy uh, again with the advocates uh, again she she's been working with the advocates and it's it's been an amazing journey i think particularly the community in argentina is is amazing even from the early you know my early beginnings of the web3 career uh, i like one of the people that, that i've been mostly working on with was uh, martin uh, from you know the foundation uh, as well as ariel and then later on, you know, Tomas, uh, Miguel, Pablo, all of those uh, from the contract team of Agent Node. More recently with Pilar uh, from GraphOps. Uh, she's been such a pleasure to work with. And, you know, the community, like, it, it's it's weird because th- there's a lot of crypto communities in Argentina. Like, it's like, again, you mentioned Nigeria, uh, Latin America, like all of those places that have very specific issues that uh, crypto as a whole has some answers to like, for example, I remember like people in, in, in crypto Twitter, oftentimes, you know, bash on Tron because it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's not Ethereum, whatever, like yada, yada, yada. But then you see actual people in, in you know, third world countries, like, like mine, but that's in America, like Africa, like everywhere else using USDT on Tron to transact because it's cheaper because they don't have the resources to transact if it's, you know, three bucks a transaction. And you start to see like the huge impact that those things are having on those economies. Uh, even if, it, if you kind of like think of crypto as some, some sort of niche, it does have real world usage. And it, it's super amazing to see, you know, those communities having some of their needs met with some of the actual existing crypto uh, use cases. Uh, and we don't have to go like really, uh, you know, you don't have to be going into a really cryptic, you know, censorship resistant, not only just being able to transact money in a cheap, efficient way without intervention. Like that's something that, that again, many first world countries have as guarantees, you know, like it's, it's, oh yeah, well, why wouldn't you be able to do this? Like crypto doesn't solve those issues there, uh, but in some places it does solve those issues. Uh, and again, this kind of like translates as to why those countries have so much of a strong presence of crypto communities. And, and people interested in crypto or people using crypto projects, uh, products, which I, I think it, it's, it's amazing. And, and it reflects back on all of those really common uh, financial thingies that, that people use. But it also goes back into the developers, you know, like the people that are actually living in those countries and are working as software engineers. They are eventually like met up with the existence of, you know, protocols and products and the things that need to be worked on that they have some expertise in, uh, in the sense of like, okay, I kind of like know about those technical aspects. And I also been living in a place that kind of like has those use cases as something that happens, like that normal, you normally use it. So they have like both the social aspect and the technical aspect, and they can, you know, combine those two and then try to get a better product or have feedback on, on those, those protocols. Uh, and that, that's how you, and, and also like people that are really social, you know, like interested in, you know, generating communities, gathering, uh, having, you know, discussions, uh, in, in real life, having all of those. And it's, it's amazing to see how it grows. Like if you, uh, if you've been in, in the three birthdays as I have, you can see that it was always full with people, even if they initially maybe didn't know much about the graph, they were just, you know, like the first birthday was, uh, mostly like that because there were a lot of participants of the already existing participants of the graph protocol, but also a lot of new people that were just, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what, what's the graph? Like it's okay. It's a crypto project. Like what does it solve? And then you see it repeatedly year after year in new birthday. And then you see the same people and then you see new people. And then you see like, I, I have even seen like, you know, people that are not from Argentina going to the Buenos Aires meetup for the graph birthday. Uh, and it's kind of like such an event. And I think we're still in the early stages, you know, like it's, it's, it's still by, by, you know, like world standards, so to speak, it's like a, a meeting of a hundred, 200 people. It's still kind of like small, but then you see it progressing year over year and people getting more and more interested and then people knowing a little bit more about it. Uh, and, and it's, it's, it's really nice. Like, uh, the only people that I haven't been able to, you know, educate on that are probably my parents that every time that I go have, you know, like Christmas dinner, uh, they always tell me, what are you working? Like I work in a crypto project that does this, this, and this. Oh, what does it solve? It solves all of those things. Like it's an infrastructure project. Oh, 
great. And then next Christmas, it's the same thing. And they like, mom, please, I already told you. <laughs> and my, it's, it's fun because my brothers and sisters are always like, they always tell me that there, there's no point in telling them. They just, you know, it just slides off or whatever. Juan, I want to thank you for coming back on the podcast. It's been super fun to reconnect and to hear your perspective as the graph has evolved. And I hope listeners can kind of grasp the nature of everything we discussed today, because what we're really talking about here is a, a you know first entry, a first mover in the Web3 ecosystem evolving and growing. And you've had a front row seat, not only to see that, but to help contribute all along the way. When it comes to all the contributions GraphOps has made, I've, of course, had other interviews with members of the team, and I'll put links to that in the show notes. But let's do some shout outs. I mean, the GraphOps core dev team makes a lot of important contributions. How would you kind of characterize those for, for listeners that are still getting familiar with everything you're working on? For sure. Yeah. First of all, like the first shout out that I would say is a uh, shout out to Unique uh, for, you know, always having me here. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, doing kind of like a B2, again, like a Horizon version of, of the interview. Like, you know, watching all of the developments happen, uh, commenting on those, you know, it, it's been, it's been extremely fun. And again, I always like every time I like see a, a DM from you, it's, it's something that I always look out for, uh, in the future. So, uh, super happy to be here. So that's, that would be my first shout out. Uh, then regarding, you know, like all of the work that we've been doing in GraphOps, uh, and it's been a journey. Uh, I, again, I've been with the graph for four years, I think with GraphOps for almost two years, a uh, year and a half, whatever. And, you know, like seeing everything grow and seeing all of those things that we were like, I remember when we were discussing GraphCast, like as something that, oh, we're going to do, like, hopefully we can do a gossip network to help indexers do things that they don't want, that they don't really need to do on chain, but they kind of like want to do in a more formal way. And then you see, oh, GraphCast is already here. You, know, you, you can actually use it. And then you have, in GraphCast, you have already like, coverage milestones that we've hit like 700 plus subgraphs covered for the POI checking uh, radio. And then you have also subgraph radio. And then you also have launchpad, you know, like something that we discussed uh, with the foundation initially, like if we need to, you know, improve client diversity at like, I think the, the initially the in mission control, the indexer stack had a Kubernetes setup, but it wasn't really like production ready. So we wanted to, you know, take the, you know, to take the, that, that, Kubernetes approach and kind of like taking it to the, to, you know, goal and, and basically working on all of those things, having Anna and Carlos, uh, put so much effort, uh, into, you know, making sure that not only Launchpad works as easily as it can work, but it's as scalable as, you know, a Kubernetes setup should be. Uh, it allows you to uh, have a lot of flexibility as it should and actually use it, you know, like we are running Launchpad in, in Indexer. So we are also uh, wanting to be our own customers in a way. Uh, but then, you know, like th those are, you know, existing uh, work streams, uh, you know, maintaining the sub graph, uh, graph cast, uh, again, shout out to hope and Petco. They've been amazing. Like the, 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 it's, it's basically our own kind of like rust fanatics that we have. And they've been so amazing at using Rust and, and you know, spreading the word of Rust <laughs> across the team that now we're basically using Rust for everything. Everything that we can have Rust on, we have Rust. Except, you know, ideally not cars. If you have a car and you have Rust on your car, you probably need to get it checked. But, you know, <laughs> for the most part, everything that we can have Rust on and it's not something bad, we, we have it there. To the point that we are basically working on something called Graphs here. I think we had a discussion in IOH Again, shout out to IOH. We, it, it's always nice to see the participants be there and have those discussions as well as, you know, launchpad office hours, which is another kind of like different approach to IOH to, for, for more like infrastructure regarding launchpad. Uh, but yeah, graphs here uh, is something else that we've been working on a new work stream that we are hopefully going to be releasing the MVP or first version, hopefully relatively soon, like early to mid February. I don't want to, again, don't quote me on that. Because, uh, you know, software development has always had, uh, you know, issues trying to estimate things, but it's been, it's been, it's been super cool seeing, you know, Sarah and Bura, another, like we're a small team, so it, I'm probably going to be doing a shout out for everyone, but, uh, having them, you know, work on graphs here, which is basically going to be kind of like an explorer, a data rich explorer. That's going to be more like indexer oriented or, or indexer and, and developer oriented, uh, in the sense that we are going to target 
having available a lot of the QS data from the gateways, as well as, you know, data from uh, on-chain sources and hopefully off-chain sources too, so that indexers can see all of their metrics in one place and can play around with, with visualizations of the data and, you know, make everything hopefully, hopefully a lot more useful for, for indexers. And the, the fun thing about this is it's a front end that's actually written in Rust. Uh, so we are putting Rust everywhere, <laughs> like literally everywhere. Uh, it had its own challenges, but, you know, the, thankfully the team uh, had a lot of experience in Rust and we can uh, work on those things and, and, you know, we feel proud of the work that we've been doing and the decisions that we've been having. And so far, it's been an amazing journey. There's also another shout out again. I, I don't want to take much time, but uh, Hope, and again, one of the greatest of all time uh, in all of the development community has been working a lot on, on something called the file hosting service, which is, again, getting into the world of data services. It's kind of like a, a new data service that would allow you to share files uh, and have an economic incentive to share files. Uh, and this was primarily you know, focused on in the, the indexer community and having indexers be able to share snapshots of subgraphs or you know, snapshots of, um, different, uh, you know, uh, different chains, like different RPCs for different chains so that they can actually uh, speed up their, their syncing process on, on either subgraphs or chains or whatever, uh, which is not, you know, only something that indexers that already have those things can leverage to, you know, make their business, uh, more profitable, but also, uh, newcomers can actually leverage to have, you know, a, a, an easy setup and a faster startup for, you know, an indexer in the, the community. So it kind of like lowers the, the bar that, that people need to go through in order to, to be a participant in the community, which is something that's always going to be nice. Again, all of those things are things that are being worked on that, that we are really proud of. Hopefully we can deliver as much as we want to deliver in those, uh, in the uh, timeframes that we're saying, again, with, with all things software development, Things happen, uh, so you have to sort them out. But but it's it's always such a fun, challenging uh, experience that uh, you know we're we're really glad to have the opportunity to be here doing those things. Well, one, I appreciate the very kind words, and I feel the same about you. We've been friends for two years, and yet we've still never sat in the same room. But I really appreciate the relationship, and I acknowledge all the contributions you personally have made from the very early days all the way up to the things you're doing with the entire GraphOps team. And we'll put links in all the show notes, all the different things that you're contributing for listeners that want to dive a little deeper. Juan, the first time we met, the GRT IQ 10 wasn't a thing yet. But since that time, I've added this final segment to every podcast. These are 10 questions I ask the guests of the podcast each week. And I do it because I think it's fun to kind of shine a personal light on each guest. But it also might motivate listeners to learn something new, try something different, or achieve more in their own life. So, Juan, are you ready for the GRT IQ 10? Totally ready. The GRT IQ 10. This is the one. 10 questions for astronauts floating in space. Please. 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 What book or article has had the most impact on your life? Oh, geez, that, that's a good one. Um, I would want to go with book now, and I would say probably it's, it's like, I would say a tie between Brave New World and Nighting. 84. It's probably going to be kind of like a cliche answer, uh, but it really, I mean, I, I, I don't read that many books, but those books were not only amazing uh, by themselves, but they were really kind of like, you know, uh, you, you can see it online, all of the comparisons about like how the world is evolving into either one of those or a mixture of both. Uh, and it's super uh, weird and, and kind of like interesting to see it unfold and, you know, like you kind of like read those books and, and think, or, you know, it, it's weird. It's kind of like mind blowing that, that all things kind of like happen in a different way, but in a sort of like similar way. So I would say, uh, I don't know if it kind of like marked my life and how I approach things, but for sure it has uh, blown my mind uh, a couple of times. And how about this? Is there a movie or a TV show that you would recommend everybody should watch? Uh, <laughs> I, I can probably make a list of those. If you would have asked me this, like, not 10 years ago, but like five years ago, I would say Breaking Bad because I was such a fan of Breaking Bad. But currently, uh, you know, like things like The Sopranos, uh, things like, you know, I, I'm also kind of like a sci-fi geek in a way. Uh, the Expanse has been great, like amazing show. 
if you like sci-fi. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there's way too many of those. I can probably like, even like if you like, like really weird comedy, like Rick and Morty, like it, there's many things that you can, that I can recommend. Like I, I love watching uh, series and I love watching movies. So uh, I, I can probably discuss this for like years, but yeah, those would be like the first ones that come to mind. If you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? No, don't do this to me, Nick. <laughs> only one music album? I'm, I'm, I'm going to hate myself after that. Um, I've been a fan of Rosalia ever since she started with, you know, all of the flamenco albums. So uh, I would say, I don't want to go with the classics. Uh, I would say probably, yeah, the, the Motomami uh, from Rosalia because it kind of like mixes like everything like the, again in Argentina we have a lot of you know Latin American culture so we uh, love reggaeton and all of those things so kind of like Motomami fits there and also it fits with all of that uh, you know flamenco style that, that Rosalia had so I, I would say probably that uh, although I would probably get tired of, of listening to the same album over and over but at least it's going to be a, a decent album to to get tired of Juan, what's the best advice someone's ever given to you? Oh, that, that's deep. Um, I don't know. Like, it, I, I don't want to paraphrase, you know, like advices that people have, have given me over time. But uh, I would say probably uh, my, my parents, uh, they, again, they are, both of them are, are university professors. Uh, so like, they've always kind of like tried to, you know, give me as much freedom as I, as I want to have, but at the same time trying to, you know, line me up to not get carried away with, you know, life and try to, you know, take the most of life and at the same time, you know, learn new things, you know, like, like get interested in, like get curious about things. Uh, I, I always remember my, my parents always, you know, encouraged me to learn things and, 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 you know, that's pretty much how I do things now. Like I, I, had gone through university, right? But at the same time, I keep on getting curious about things. I watch shows about things. I watch uh, YouTube uh, videos about things. Like I, 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 one weird fact would be like I, I really love things about you know uh, radioactivity, right? Like I, I, li- I love the all of those things that you know that the history of uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima, how like fusion works, how fusion works. And I'm not a uh, you know I'm not a physics professor. I'm not even interested in physics per se like i don't like the math aspects of it so much Uh, but at the same time i'm really interested in in in, in those things i'm really interested in many things and i think being interested in things and curious about things uh, is something that my parents uh, kind of like fostered in me and even though it wasn't like technically an advice like they didn't you know sit me and tell me you need to be curious it's kind of like some you know those uh, those subconscious advices that they give you by how they behave right so I would I would say that's probably the most imp- like the most uh, important and, and the most you know shaping advice that I could get. What's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most other people have learned or know quite yet? Oh, oof. Um, there's probably quite a few, but I think <laughs> when you said that, the first thing that came to mind was when I was working in the in my first job. I was working as a, like I uh, every. Like every job that I had was in, in software development, but it was like in different stages and different like weird ways. And the first one that I worked on was a workers cooperative, which was uh, also a dev shop. So uh, the two things that came to mind were, mind were, you know, working on a workers cooperative that we were almost 30 people. Like every Wednesday, uh, like every Wednesday morning, we had what we call an assembly where we, uh, each all of us gathered in, in the same room and discussed you know, how are we going to do things? Like what, what, what's the decisions that the company needs to make? Like, even if we are not, uh, you know, people that we're not CEOs, we don't know shit about it. We still, you know, like, even if we knew nothing about it, we still uh, had to take decisions, had we, each of us had a voice. And even uh, like in, in those situations, most people don't, you, they, they are like, you know, like they, they are slightly scared about speaking up. Uh, but we always fostered, you know, uh, try to, you know, convince people to, you, you need to speak up. If you, if you have something to say, please speak up. I think that kind of like is something that most people don't go through, uh, unless they are CEOs again, or, you know, have administrative roles. 
particularly software developers, they don't usually have to go through those things. And I think that shaped me up to be who am I today, like that, that I, that I kind of like have those social aspects of, you know, interaction, uh, pretty set in stone for me. And then at the same time, the other, <laughs> the other memory that came was also working in the workers cooperative and having to deploy uh, a product and the product wasn't, you know, like a software product that, that, you know, like a web page or, or whatever, it was a parking meter. Uh, so we had to, we had to work with, you know, my fair cars, like they had only one kilobyte of storage. We had to make everything that we needed to fit there. So it was a, a really weird experience, uh, for someone that, you know, like just graduated university and was, uh, accustomed to, I don't know, uh, JavaScript or Java. And, and suddenly you have, okay, we have to fit everything in one kilobyte. Like, what are you going to do? And that also kind of like, I think shaped me into being resourceful, maybe like, you know, like. If we have a challenge that's, you know, weird for most people, I, I'm probably going to say, okay, like, let's, you know, let's figure it out. Like, we have to figure it out, so let's figure it out. Uh, so, yeah, I think those those two are the memories that came to mind. What's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? Oh, oof, life hacks. Uh, there's like a ton, I guess. <laughs> um, what's the first one that comes to mind? You can reuse, um, you know, used coffee for fertilizer you don't really need to buy fertilizer you can if you need fertilizer you can use the, the your you know your coffee packs your filtered coffee uh, leftovers that you can actually use those based on your own life experience and observations is there one habit or characteristic that you think would just best explain how or why people find success in life i don't really consider myself very successful uh, it's like uh, I don't know, like I, I, I see myself like I'm doing well, well, but I don't know if I'm successful enough. I would say that if we consider myself successful, right? Uh, and, and if I have a kind of like a little bit of experience in that, uh, I would say, I don't want to say stubbornness, but something along the line, like, you know, like being stubborn in the sense of not being overly stubborn where you kind of like try to make something that's never going to work, work. But, you know, like not letting people say, that you can do X or Y, right? Like not being so easily convinced that your own beliefs or your own, you know, uh, things that you're, you're trying to do are not worth it. Like if you, if you, if people can convince you so easily about something that you, you, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that or whatever, most of the time you're just going to be, you know, doing what everything, everyone does. And like, you know, statistically you're most likely uh, you, you could be sort of successful, but maybe you're not as successful as you could be uh, if you listen to yourself. Uh, I guess that that's uh, one habit that I think successful people would have, or at least it's it's one thing that I kind of like think of that, you know, if people say that this is not going to work or you should do this this way. And I think it's, it's, we should do it another way. I, at least I'm going to speak up. Uh, and at the worst, I'm going to try to do it anyways, but you know, uh, I think, I think that's, that's pretty one of those characteristics. And then the final three questions, Juan, are complete the sentence type questions. So the first one is complete the sentence. The thing that most excites me about web three is it's either the, the, you know, the speed at which it evolves, you know, like how, how fast it moves. But at the same time, also the the challenges that the future holds. It's either one of those. I'm not sure which one, but I think both of those uh, probably uh, are probably good ways to end the sentence. And how about this sentence? If you're on X, formerly Twitter, then you should be following. Oh, geez, don't put me in that one. <laughs> but you should be following way too many accounts uh, for me to shout out. But on the top of my mind, you should be following, you know, GRTIQ. You should be following the IOH account. You should be following Graph Protocol and all of the other core developers because each and every one of those have interesting things that they say uh, and that they are sharing. Again, I'm, I'm one of those core developers. I'm, I'm, I'm part of GraphOps, uh, but I can say like Masari, yeah, Streaming Fast, Edge and Node, like all of those have great things that they're always sharing and, and you know, uh, keeping up with, with all of the new information is, is in extremely important to, you know, to have all of the latest data, to have, you know, informed decisions whenever you have to take a decision, uh, to have all of the knowledge, to also be fostering curiosity, right? Like 
all of those things, like for example, streaming fast, adding substreams, adding like when they join the graph, like just kind of breaking everything into, okay, we need to do flat files and, you know, all of those things. And then, then it was like, oh, we can do that. You know, like uh, it, it's amazing. So I, I would say follow all of them in X slash Twitter. I'm too young and at the same time too old for this. Like I'm still going to be calling Twitter. It's too weird to call it X, but uh, you know, uh, it is what it is. Same here. And the final question then, Juan, is this one. Complete the sentence. I'm happiest when? When everything works after we deploy. <laughs> and probably when nothing, when subgraphs don't break when I'm on holiday. Uh, unfortunately, it happens. Uh, but, you know, yeah. Uh, I, like, aside from the obvious joke. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm all, all of the time happy. Thankfully, I have a lot of great people around me. I'm really, really happy and and you know i don't know how to say it, but I'm, I'm yeah i'm happy and i'm i'm super pumped that that you know i have so many great people around me and that they think that i'm also super cool and that i you know get to experience all of those things i get to be part of a community that's so amazing like again like i i, I we discussed this during the the whole uh episode but uh, it's not just you know a, a product it's not just a job it's also all of the friends that you made with that. It's also all of the friends that you made with the community. It's all, also all of the experiences that you got with all of those people. So to be honest, I'm happy. I'm just happy. It, does, it doesn't matter, you know, like uh, it's, again, I don't want to go into cliches, but it, it just forces me to, you know. The GRT IQ 10. And I show you how deep the podcast Incredible. Juan, thank you so much for joining the GRTIQ podcast. And for listeners that want to follow you, stay in touch with the things you're working on. We'll put some links in the show notes, but what's the best way to do it? You can do it anywhere. Like I, I'm pretty much everywhere. Like if you want to uh, contact me through Discord, well, you'll find me in the, I think in the right bar in the, under the core developers. Twitter, I think you can link the Twitter. Yeah, it's basically my name shorted out. Uh, so yeah, it, it's going to be in the link in the show notes. Uh, either, you know, X Twitter uh, or Discord, uh, you'll be able to to reach me. And hopefully, <laughs> if a lot of people reach me, uh, I can I can get to all of you uh, in, in the shortest way possible. But yeah. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq.com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G-R-T-I-Q podcast.